This morning we're in the gospel according to Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 to 25 as we're making our way through Kingdom Citizens. And uh, we're going to read this and pray. The Bible says in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, let's all say this together, God with us. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till that just as a, an idiom, it's a way of saying, did not have sexual relationships with her, did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word today, and uh, there's so much here, so much that oftentimes, God, I confess, we don't consider when it comes to the virgin birth of your son. And so I pray today that you would help us to engage, God, that we would be ready, prepared, anticipating your spirit to speak to our hearts. God, our desire today is to sit at the feet of Jesus, and we confess to you today that we want to see him in ways we've never seen him before. God, we want to fall deeper and deeper in love with him. We want to be hungrier for your word and that God it would be more than bread to us that we would sustain our spirit through the study of the scriptures father fall on us we confess we need you today we need you more than we even realize and so God your word says uh, that the scriptures are as a fire and we pray that your fire would fall from heaven and touch our hearts today in Jesus name amen you know this song, uh, but <clears throat> this is how it goes. Silent night, holy night. I'm not going to sing it, so like, don't be afraid today. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, tender and mild. Isn't this just nice? Some of you are falling asleep right now. Sleep in heavenly peace. And then the refrain, the refrain says again, sleep in heavenly peace. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful picture, and I think most likely when we think of the virgin birth of Christ 2,000 years ago, this is what we think of. We think of this um, sweet, beautiful, tender moment when there was a hush that fell over uh, all the earth, and in that gentle, tender moment where everything, in a sense, came to a stop, ceased, and in that moment of silence the son of god was born and you know for many of us when it, we don't really even think about the virgin birth of jesus until christmas rolls around some of you are like pastor we got three months or four months until december why are we talking about christmas now because christmas is every day and we don't want to just think of the virgin birth you know in a particular season because the, the problem with that is this uh, we reduce it to something less than God intends it to be. Or we see it from just merely a shallow perspective when there's so much more to it. You know, for many of us, this is the framework for that evening. It's a gentle, sweet, tender moment where angels were singing and shepherds were coming. Um, yet the reality is this. Nothing could be further from the truth. He was born in a time of war. He was born in a time of brutality. He was born in a time of chaos and great difficulty. 
as the nation of Israel, and in fact the whole world was straining under the despotic rule of Rome, the Roman Empire. And it wasn't just that moment. It was uh, the first couple years of his life. You remember uh, two years or so into his life, the uh, wise men, we're going to talk about this next week, the wise men came and they brought their offerings and uh, they were warned. They had gone to Herod and said, where is this? He who was born the king of the Jews, Herod being a very paranoid king, they didn't want any competition for his thr- throne. He says, well, when you find him, you come back and you tell me where he is. And the, the angel warned the kings who had come to offer worship to this Christ, and they had, they had warned them. So, you know, the uh, wise men went back a different way, and Herod sent his soldiers into Bethlehem. And you remember the story. There were um, all of the young Jewish boys, two years old and under, were slaughtered. And so my point is this. He was born in a very brutal, chaotic uh, time of war. And the virgin birth of Jesus Christ is so much more than oftentimes we think it is. It really conveys the uniqueness of our king. In fact, as you look at the genealogies, you see the word beget repeated over and over and over again. And this was the process of individuals who were going to be kings. This is how they were established as kings. Their fathers begat them. And yet when you come to Joseph, you notice that that word is conspicuously missing because Joseph did not beget Jesus. Jesus was be- the only begotten son of God. And the virgin birth conveys it. In fact, Another uh, Christmas hymn that we enjoy singing goes like this. God of God, light of light, lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb, very God begotten, not created. And then the refrain is sung, oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. I would say to you, and I just want to submit this to you today, that without verses 18 and 25, 18 through 25. If you pulled these verses out of the gospel according to Matthew, the rest of the gospel has absolutely no meaning at all. Let me say it a different way. If it wasn't for the virgin birth, you might as well tear the rest of the gospel account out of your Bible. The life that he lived, the sacrifice that he made, there would have been no resurrection or ascension of Jesus Christ. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential for all of those things. And it has great significance for us this morning. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the significance of the virgin birth. And I'm just going to be very frank with you today. I'm going to be sharing things in a way that is going to require you to give uh, the things that are spoken some thought. Uh, And so this is like a, this is like a mini, this is like a mini Bible college class this morning. I know some of you are like, I didn't come for Bible college class on Sunday morning, pastor. It's my day off. I don't think on Sundays. Well, I need you to think a little bit today. And I think that as you engage yourself, because you're not just here physically, it's good that you're here physically, but for some of us, the extent of uh, our worship is physical attendance. But you know that being here is just part of it. That's good. God wants you to be here physically, but he wants you to be engaged mentally and spiritually as well. And as we do that today, I'm guaranteeing God has a blessing for us. The virgin birth, obviously, as we just think about the story, was not something easy for Joseph to understand. And this was how uh, the story worked out. I know you know it. I just want to reiterate it to you again today. When, uh, When you went through the betrothal process in ancient Israel, remember... Uh, in that particular culture, there was a matchmaker, and a matchmaker would be making matches between families when the children were very, very young. And so apparently what had happened is Joseph and Mary had, had a matchmaker involved in their lives at a very young age. Uh, their parents had committed them to each other. And as they grew up and as they were coming to the age where they could be married, they were, they were brought together. Now, scholars differ on this. Some say that Joseph and Mary could have been as young as 14 when they were betrothed to each other. 
um, maybe even all the way up to 17 or 18. What we know is they were very young. But at that point of time where they were of marrying age, they would have been brought together. They would have gone through a betrothal process where a contract would have been signed. And this contract established them as husband and as wife. In fact, it was so binding, it was such a, a, a binding contract that literally to, um, to have the contract broken, it would actually take a divorce. Now, though they would be considered husband and wife, they would not physically consummate the marriage relationship sexually. In fact, they would be separated physically for at least a year. And this, this is what was called the betrothal process. So they were betrothed to each other. They were, they were um, officially husband and wife, but they were not having sexual relationships. And this period of time of separation was intended so that it could prove the purity of the woman. Remember, there was no uh, ultrasound. There was no pregnancy test. And so... To establish the purity of the woman, there was separation for at least a year. During that time, the, the groom would be preparing a place for him and his bride to live. They would be building a house attached to his father's house. And when the father felt like the time was right, he would say to his son, undisclosed to anybody else, he would say to his son, it's time for you to go get your bride. And so there would be a massive procession, and all of this is pictured throughout the gospel accounts. There would be this massive procession that would go through the village, the town, or the city, and the, the bride would have been living for a year in a state of preparation, preparing herself, not knowing when her groom was going to come. By the way, beautiful picture of the rapture of the church. I don't have time to go into it today, but all of this is uh, symbolic of what the Lord is doing in our lives. He has gone to prepare a place for us. And when the Father says, go get your bride, undisclosed time, we're the bride preparing ourselves for the coming of our King. He's going to come and get us and take us to be where He is. That's for a different study down the road. So the groom, the groomsmen, the entourage would come. The bride, her bridesmaid would be preparing uh, themselves. They would have a seven-day, at least a seven-day celebration, marriage ceremony. Then after that, he would take his bride into the little house he had made attached to his father's house, and they would sexually consummate the marriage. Um, so, so it was evident to Joseph. All of the signs were there. This Mary that he loved so much that he knew loved the Lord. Mary loved the Lord. She was an amazing woman, and she had a deep, deep faith in God. And so you can imagine Joseph's shock. You can imagine his amazement. You can imagine the horror that he was walking through as it was evident his betrothed, whom he had assumed was absolutely pure, was now with child. And so the angel comes to him and the angel says, Joe, chill out, bro. Everything's cool. That which is in Mary has been conceived of, and you'll notice that phrase, of the Holy Spirit appears very specifically. Can, can I say this to you today, all right? And I don't want to... <sighs> Paraphrases of the Bible are good. Literal translations are better, okay? When you're studying the Word of God... I just want to submit this to you today. Every word is important, and the arrangement of the words are important as well. If I am uh, quoting from a paraphrase, I will never say to you, the Bible says. I will say to you, this paraphrase of the Bible says, because a paraphrase of the Bible is taken by translators and communicated in a way that they think best conveys what the original text says. That is very different than a word-for-word -word translation. Every word here is important. Every word is significant, and the arrangement of the words are important as well. She was with child that had been conceived of the Holy Spirit. And so the angel says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife and the child that she bears you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin and this is what Joseph does he's a just man he loves 
his betrothed. He breaks that betrothal period and immediately takes her as his wife. Um, and he breaks tradition. And he protects her reputation. And he obeys the word of God, which, you know, the character of Joseph is a study for another time. But this morning, I just want to talk very briefly to you about uh, the meaning of the virgin birth. When I use the word incarnation, or when you are singing songs in four months that use the word incarnation, or we talk about um, the incarnation, what does that word mean? It means this, and it's up on the screen for you. It's the divine act by which the second person of the triune Godhead became human flesh. That's what incarnation means. It is the divine act by which the second person of the triune Godhead took upon himself, that's what I mean when I say the word became, took upon himself a, a human physical body. John in his first gospel, in his only gospel account, says this, John chapter 1 verse 14, and the word became flesh. The word for word in the Greek is logos, that word uh, is referring to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Word became flesh, incarnation, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And then again in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says this, Paul speaking to Timothy, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's the incarnation. That's the second person of the triune Godhead being conceived of the Holy Spirit placed in the womb of Mary. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the incarnation. The incarnation means three specific things to us today. Number one is this. The virgin birth or the incarnation of Christ was God's chosen means of identifying his Messiah or identifying our King. So what is the significance of the virgin birth? You know, as we look back 2,000 years ago, is it just this beautiful night where a hush fell over all of creation and there's these tender, warm feelings that we feel once a year as we consider the Christmas story? No, so much more than that. So much more than that. It was God's chosen means of identifying his Messiah, our King. Let me say it a different way. God was saying this to us. I want you to know. I want you to know who my, my Messiah, my anointed one is, who is going to redeem humanity and reconcile a lost humanity to myself. And I'm going to identify him for you. He will be your King. This is how you will know who he is. He will be born of a virgin. God spoke that before it ever happened. We talk about um, God speaking things in great specificity and detail before they ever happen, uh, and we call that prophecy. This is what the purpose of prophecy is. God wants you to know that he has spoken it, that he has ordained it. And so God tells us very specifically about things before they ever happen. In Isaiah 42, 9, God says this. He says, I'm the Lord, that's my name. Or I am Yahweh, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is the only one who is able to declare things with great specificity before they ever happen. And by the way, he bats a thousand. He never fails. God says, hey, I want you to know who my Messiah is, who your king is going to be, and um, I'm going to preserve his identity from identity theft because there's going to be a lot who come and say that they're the Messiah. There are going to be a lot who come and say, hey, Messiah is out in the desert. Remember, Jesus said this would be one of the signs of his second coming, 
There are going to be many false messiahs. God says this, you'll know who my messiah is. I'm going to give him an identifying mark that no one else will have, and it is called the virgin birth. The first mention of the virgin birth is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God said this right after the fall of Adam and Eve, after Adam transgressed and Eve was deceived and they ate of the fruit and the beauty of God's perfect creation fell. It was in that moment. You got to love God. You got to love God. Like in the midst of sin, what does God do? He speaks a word of reconciliation. Aren't you thankful for how good God is to you that you can be... You know, you can be in the midst of failure and difficulty and struggle, faltering, and God doesn't say, hey, you know what, you're going to have to do penance for a while. Hey, you're going you're gonna to have to um, give, or you're going to have to serve, or you're going to have to work your way out of this. No, God immediately comes with the word of reconciliation because that's how much he loves us. And so he says to the serpent, he says this, I will put enmity or war between you and the woman, between your seed, now catch this, between your seed and her seed. He, singular masculine, speaking of the seed, our Messiah, our King, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So immediately, immediately at the fall, God says, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix what you broke I'm going to fix it because you can't fix it. And this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a war. He's speaking to the devil, the serpent, the dragon of old. There's going to be war between you and her seed. He doesn't say his seed. And this was the common way of speaking. He says her seed, which is speaking of the one he would bring through the woman conceived of the Holy Spirit apart from the seed of man. There was a miraculous divine conception in the womb of Mary apart from the seed of man. It's called the virgin birth, the incarnation. And God 6,000 years ago spoke of this. This was what Paul was saying in the book of Galatians. As he picks this up, he speaks of the seed and he says the seed is the Christ. There's going to be a war. There's going to be a battle. He will bruise your head. He will crush you, but you will bruise his heel. Interesting, by the way, just a side note. Um, that one of the effects of crucifixion was a deep, deep bruise on the heel of the one being crucified. As the nail was driven through both feet, they, those being crucified would have to push themselves up to fill their lungs with air, and they would let themselves back down, and all of the weight of their body would be pressed up on one single heel of the one being crucified. So in a way, God even speaking of the method that um, the Messiah would be, would be tortured or crucified. So 6,000 years ago, and then in, again in Isaiah 7:14, The prophet Isaiah said this 2,600 years ago, 600 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. He said, this is going to be the sign. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So why is the virgin birth so significant? Because it's God's chosen means Um, of identifying his Messiah. John says in his first epistle, chapter 4, that anyone who denies that Christ has come, come from God in the flesh, incarnation, virgin birth, anyone who denies this is not of the Father. The second thing, if you're taking notes this morning, why is the virgin birth so significant? The second thing is this, it preserves the nature of our King. You guys with me today? Everybody okay? Okay. I don't want any glazed over eyeballs this morning. So stick with me. The second thing is this, the virgin birth is important, it's significant, it's important to us because it preserves the nature of our king. Our king, what's his name? Jesus. Say it like you mean it. Jesus. Okay, our king is God. Our king is God. The title of this message today, I added the definite article, our king is the God. So it's not that he is a God. He's not a God among many gods. Jesus Christ, our King, is the God. 
and the virgin birth of Christ preserves his deity. In fact, here in verse 23, you can look at this again. As Matthew's quoting Isaiah 7, 14, he adds a bit um, for our benefit. He says this, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So the very name of our Messiah conveys this, and you're going to see this, that the virgin birth and the deity of Jesus Christ are inextricably linked together. They're tied together. It was necessary. Without the virgin birth, Jesus maybe would have been a good prophet. He maybe would have been a good moral man, but he never would have been God, and he never would have been able to pay the price for the sin of humanity. That's how important the virgin birth is. It preserves the deity of our Savior. Isaiah 9, 6, another very familiar verse, uh, at least once a year for us, goes like this. For unto us a child is born, Unto us, notice this, very important, unto us a son is given, given by whom? Given by the Father, expressing his pre-existence and his deity. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called, let's, let's say it together, all right? Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so you see the virgin birth tied to the deity of Jesus Christ expressed not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. He is the mighty God. Our King is the God, the second person of the Trinity. The next thing is this, um, the virgin birth preserves the nature of our King. Uh, he is God. He is also eternal. He is also eternal. Uh, Jesus did not just come into existence when he was conceived in that world womb as every other human being does. We believe that life begins at conception. That's when it begins. And that is true for every human being except Jesus Christ. He eternally existed. Now there are some who say that we eternally exist as well, that we pre-existed uh, our life pre-existed conception. This is what the Mormons teach. This is absolutely not what the Bible teaches. Our life began at conception, and so it is for every single human being except Jesus Christ. He pre-existed. He was, in a sense, let me just say it like this, he was, in a sense, placed, the eternal God was placed in the womb of Mary. John, again, in his gospel account, verse 1, says this, in the beginning. By the way, did you know uh, God is a baseball fan? It's biblical, you know that? In the big inning. <laughs> In the beginning was the word, was the logos, was Jesus Christ. So the picture is this, and this is the way uh, the word uh, beginning. When we're talking about eternity, this is the way the word works. You look as far as you can at the horizon and everything beyond that. Have you ever tried to think about infinity before? Have you ever tried to think about eternity? Like your, your brain begins to hurt, it begins to ache, smoke comes out of your ears. We're, we're finite beings and then thinking about the infinite is just, you know, it's beyond us. Jesus Christ existed before the, before the world was ever made. In the beginning was the Word, was the Logos, was Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then in verse 14, the Bible says, and the Word became flesh. So he was with God before anything was ever made. The preposition with means to be face to face. It means to be in absolute unity. It means total complete harmony this is important for us because you know last week i was talking about the condescension of jesus christ how far he had to go how far he had to go from the glory of heaven sitting on the throne adulation of angels day and night singing to him holy 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 is the lord god almighty he is the one who was and who is and who is to come and you think about his eternality and his immensity and how extraordinary he is. And then how loving he was to condescend 
to transverse that eternal gap between heaven and earth and to take upon himself this human flesh. You know, you might be, you might be sitting here today thinking, what does this have to do with me, pastor? How does this affect me? Well, listen, self-absorbed Christian, let me say this to you today. <laughs> Because, can I, can I just say this about our Christian culture? We are so self-absorbed. We, are, we don't even want to admit it. Everything is about us. Everything revolves around us. Everything has to have meaning to us. It's all for us. And, and this is the thing. That's, that's not really what life is all about. It's not what life is all about. Some of us are on this pursuit. We're just trying to discover ourselves. Listen, when you discover yourself, you're not going to like what you find. Okay? You're just not going to like it. And all of that stuff, all of the answers that you're searching for, every single one is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Every single one. You want those things dealt with? You want those things made right you want to understand you want to discover God says don't look at that look at Jesus look at my son and this is what happens when you and I focus on his character and on his nature we are brought we should be brought we must be brought I pray to God that we are brought to a place of worship I pray that we are brought to a place where this is what happens in our life are you kidding me God, are you kidding me? Jesus, you're that immense, you're that glorious, you're that amazing, you're that marvelous, you're that miraculous, you are beyond my understanding, you are beautiful beyond description. My earthly words fall short. Even the praise of my lips is insignificant in consideration of how glorious you are. That's what happens. That's what's supposed to happen. Don't get me wrong today. We worship, we worship the Lord because of what he's done. We worship the Lord because of what he's done. But there's a higher motivation. The higher motivation for the worship of Jesus Christ is this. We worship him because of who he is. If your worship of Christ is only connected to what he has done in your life, and I'm not saying it's a bad motivation, we should worship him because of that. But I'm saying this, sometimes you don't feel like he's done. Sometimes he doesn't do the way you want him to do. Sometimes your expectation falls short. And then what happens to your worship in those times? What motivation do you have in those times? You come into the congregation of God's people and you might think something like this. Well, you haven't done or you haven't fulfilled or you haven't answered. What about that wife I've wanted? What about that husband I've desired? What about those children I've been praying for? God, where is your answer to me? Give me one good reason why I should worship you. And the answer is this. You worship him for who he is. Jesus Christ is the God. He is eternal. And that should be significant. Our king is the God. Our king is eternal. The virgin birth also pre preserves his sinless nature. He is sinless. Our king is sinless. He is sinless in nature. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Most scholars believe that the depraved nature... Can I mess up your self-esteem today? Most scholars believe the depraved nature that all of us have. We are all born with the propensity to sin. If you have kids, you know it. How many of you had to teach your kids to be selfish? I mean, immediately. Dang things, crying in the middle of the night, just wants food constantly. Food, consolation, got to be stroke it's like everything revolves around them well yeah because they were born with a with a depraved nature how many of you had to teach your kids to lie they probably learned it from you but <laughs> but look sin it, sin comes natural sin comes natural because we are born with a depraved nature most scholars believe that that depraved nature is transferred from the seed of the Father. There was something unique and distinct about Jesus Christ. He did not have a depraved, sinful nature. The virgin birth preserved his sinlessness. Luke 1.35 says this, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Of God, that Holy One, 
This is the term that's used or applied to Jesus Christ. If you, and I would encourage you to do this, if you do a name study or you study the phrase Holy One from Genesis to Revelation, you'll discover that it appears 55 times in the Bible. And it never refers to anybody else except the second person of the triune Godhead. The name Holy One always applies to Jesus Christ because he is unique, he is distinct, he is the only one that can be called the Holy One. The virgin birth preserved his sinless nature. He was also sinless in practice. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Or in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it's up on the screen as well. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. So he had a sinless nature, but he was also sinless in practice. And those who lived with Jesus saw this. They knew this. Even his enemies experienced this. When Christ was brought before the Sanhedrin, before Annas and Caiaphas, you remember, they sought to bring a charge against him, but they could find none because he never sinned. In fact, they had to create, they had to manufacture, they had to get people to lie about Jesus because his life was so absolutely perfect. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And then he says this concerning Jesus, an Old Testament quote, he who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So the second thing the virgin birth conveys to us, it is important, it's absolutely significant. The passion of the Christ, in fact, we're going to see here in a minute, means nothing without it. It's God's way of identifying his Messiah. It preserves the nature of our king. And the third thing is this, the virgin birth secures the sufficiency of his sacrifice. It secures the sufficiency of his sacrifice. You know, we talk a lot. And I'll tell you, as a pastor and as a preacher, um, I give a lot of time and attention to this because it's, it's the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And a lot of times when we talk about the giving part, we focus on the crucifixion, uh, the suffering, the substitution, what he endured for us, the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, and listen, rightfully so. You know, the, what great love was demonstrated by Jesus Christ on our behalf. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And we focus on the resurrection, which is obviously Vital as well, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but sometimes not enough attention is given to the perfect life that he lived. He lived an absolutely perfect life, and the perfection of his life, his submission to the will of the Father, his obedience to the commands of God, his fulfillment of the law on our behalf, secured the sufficiency of his sacrifice. He lived a sinless life. He is the God. He is our King. But because he lived a sinless life, what he gave for us on the cross was absolutely sufficient. And it was sufficient not only for you and for me who have believed, but it was sufficient for the sin of the whole world. He atoned for the sin of the whole world. You know, I think a couple of months ago, um, I was talking to you about this, and, and I did a really rude calculation it probably, I don't know how close it was to reality, but it went something like this. How many sins have ever been committed? Like if you start with Adam and you go uh, all the way to today, how many people have lived on this earth and how many sins have actually been committed? Very difficult to figure out. So let's just start with an estimation of how many people have lived since the time of Adam. And so I did a, a very basic calculation, came up with, you know, trillions of people. That's a lot. It's a big number, very large number. And I said, okay, what if all of those people only sinned once in their life? And I know we're thinking, man, I'd like to just have a day that was like that, or even like 10 minutes that was like that. But just for the sake of the illustration, what if all of those people only sinned once? 
if all of those people who have lived from Adam till now only sinned once, think about the weight of sin that was laid upon the person of Christ, and then think about the other side of that, how sufficient, how powerful, how miraculous his sacrifice for us was. And then you think, hey, a person who lives 50 years doesn't just sin once. We're talking about tens of thousands of offenses against God. And look, the procedure for me brings me to a point where I begin to recognize and realize, Lord, there is nothing like your sacrifice. There's nothing like the sufficiency of your life and how you broke the power of sin, not just for me, but for all of humanity. First John chapter 2, verse 2 says this, He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And, the, and then John the Baptist, you remember this, when John saw Jesus, he said this, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of some. Of a few? I don't know what paraphrase you're using. Of just a couple, he takes away the sin of the world, the sufficiency of the sacrifice of Christ. This is why the angel said this, you'll call his name Jesus, or you'll call his name Yeshua, or Joshua, because he will save his people from their sin. His perfect life destroyed the power of sin, death, and hell. When he hung on the cross, you remember the sun was obscured for over three hours, and then he came forth. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said, it is finished. He said, I thirst. And then he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. And there was a great shaking of the earth. The Bible says that tombs were opened. Old Testament prophets came out. And then even something more significant, the veil in the temple that separated the holy of holies from the holy place and the outer court was torn in two from top to bottom. Commentators say that veil was 16 to 18 inches thick and God tore it in two. It was, it was the separation of the world from the most holy place where one man from one tribe from one nation one time every year would go into the presence of God and offer a sin offering for himself and for the nation and this was what God was saying the sacrifice of my son has provided atonement so that that veil of separation has been torn in two and full access has been granted now into my presence it's good The author to the book of Hebrews said this, Therefore, brethren and sisters, don't want to leave you out, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. How do you get to God? How do you get to God? You get to God by going through the veil. The veil is the body. It's the virgin birth. It's the incarnation. How significant is it? I can't even tell you today beyond what we can imagine. Access is, to God is granted when you put your trust and faith in what the Son did for you and did for me. So there's no sin too great. There's no condition of life you're in that God can't deliver you from. When he died on the cross, he died for what seems to us to be the most insignificant sin. When he died on the cross, he also died for what would seem to us to be the most significant sin. It doesn't matter how deep, how dark, how scarlet that sin may be, he is able to wash you and make you as white as snow. You say, well, how can we know that his sacrifice was sufficient? It's a good question. God demonstrated for us. God showed us. God said to the world for time and eternity, the sacrifice was sufficient. Let me show you why I believe that. I'm going to raise my son from the dead on the third day. There was a sufficient sacrifice, and God demonstrated the sufficiency of it by raising his son. Death could not hold him down. Death is the result of sin, and he didn't sin, so death had no power over him. Jesus Christ broke the power of sin, death, and hell. He reversed the curse. And so let me ask you today, who else eternally existed, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died for your sins, and triumphantly rose again from the dead on the third day? There's only one, 
and his name is Jesus. And my prayer today for us is as we consider the incarnation, as we take of the bread and of the cup today, that we would consider, listen, that we would consider the significance of what he has done for us. You know, you may come in, I know this is a, this Bible study has been laden with some theology, but this is what it has to do. It has to bring you to a place where your eyes are taken off of all the stuff that just is insignificant, all of the distractions, all the bells and whistles of this world that garner and gain your attention, and that we would be drawn around the person of Christ who is our King. He is the God. He is eternal. He is sinless. His sacrifice was sufficient. And outside of anything he's ever done for us, because let me tell you something, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess, every single one, because he is the king of glory. Apart from anything he's ever done for you or through you, this is what he deserves. It's what he deserves. He deserves our worship. He deserves our praise. Church is not about this building. It's not about music. It's not about musicians or instruments. It's not about a pastor. It's not about a website. It's not about a ministry. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. God does not want us going through the motions of Christianity and missing the most significant thing, and that is His Son, our Savior, our Deliverer, Jesus Christ, who loved us so much that he left the glory of heaven and took this, he took this upon himself and he ordered his life with self-control, lived in perfection and then took this and submitted it to vicious cruelty and torture so that in that moment the weight of God's wrath and punishment that I deserved and that you deserve was laid Upon this, he was a sacrifice, dying in our place. And we come to the table today. We come to the table today to say, you're my God, and you're my king, and I love you, and I'm not going to be distracted by the things of this world, and you deserve more than a lukewarm life. You deserve all of my life, and I want to live for your glory. If you did that for me, how could I not do that for you? So here I am once again, not just part of me, not just a section of me, but God, all of me, because this is what you deserve. You deserve all of me. You are the king of glory. And so as we come to the communion table again, let's be real with God and let's get right in his eyes. Father, thank you for your word today and we pray, please, that you would stir us, that you would shake us. Your word says that the scripture is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And so if there, if there be hardness of heart in our life, God, may your word break that up so that we might be brought back into sweet fellowship and relationship with you, that, that our lives would be centered around the person of Jesus Christ. This morning as we're praying, I just want to ask you today, is he your king? Is he the Lord of your life? Jesus Christ took on a human body for a reason, and you might have sentimental feelings towards the virgin birth, but it's so much more than sentimentality. It's Christ, the Son of God, coming for you. Have you believed? Have you humbled yourself? Have you repented of your sin? Have you trusted? He is the King of kings, and He is the Lord of lords. And today, one, one day, you will bow the knee before him, and you will either do it as friend or as foe. And on that day, I'm saying you can be prepared. You can have prepared your heart so that when your knee does bow in heaven before him, you'll be ushered in. You'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. 
Today, if you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, I believe God's brought you here for that very reason. I just want to ask you today, if this is you, you need Christ in your life, you need the forgiveness of your sins, you need to leave this place right with God, you need guilt and shame lifted from you, you need your life ordered, you need to come under the authority of Christ today. You need his healing power. You need his miraculous work in your life. You need Jesus today. This morning, if this is you, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I need him. I don't want to live another day without him. I want to submit my life to him. I want to believe in the gospel, in his sacrifice, in his resurrection. I want a real relationship with God. I want for myself the assurance of Life everlasting. Today, if this is you, I want to pray for you right where you're sitting. I'm going to ask you this morning, if this is you, raise your hand right now. Get your hand up high. God is speaking to you today, and you know you need to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Awesome. Thank you. In the back, I see your hand. Anybody else? Awesome. Thank you, sir, for raising your hand here in the center. God's so good. One more moment today, if this is you, God is in a sense knocking on the door of your heart. You have an opportunity to enter into a relationship with him, forgiven of your sins. Stretch your hand up high. If you're in the overflow this morning, you can raise your hand. Our elders want to acknowledge you today. Today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and your life has not been ordered around the King and you know today you need to offer Him more than a lukewarm life, you've not been giving Him everything and you need to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ, it's not that you're not born again, but you've not been living like it and God has convicted you today and you need to live your days in such a way that God is glorified and worshiped. If this is you this morning, you need to recommit your life to Christ, would you raise your hand this morning, let me see who you are. I want to pray for you. God bless the two of you. Thank you so much. I see your hand over here on my left. God loves you. He's so faithful. He's so good. Anybody else? Awesome. I see your hand in the back. Thank you, sir, for raising your hand. All right, you can put your hands down. Listen, this is what we're going to do today, right where you're sitting this morning, right where you're sitting we're going to have communion today, and I want you to have an opportunity. For those of you who are recommitting, those of you who are freshly born into God's kingdom, I want you to have an opportunity to take communion this morning. So right where you're sitting, I'm going to lead all of you who have raised your hands in a very simple prayer. And today, you just genuinely follow me in prayer and make this your prayer to God. He has promised to hear you. Pray with me this morning. Dear God, today I give you my life. And Father, I confess... I've sinned against you. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. And today I worship him. Today I believe that he died for me and that he rose again. Today I'm making him the center of my life and I'm choosing to live for his glory. Fill me, I pray, with your Holy Spirit. Lead me and guide me in paths of righteousness for your namesake. In Jesus' name I pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. Awesome. Praise God. God bless you guys. Today, if you need prayer, we're available to lift you up in prayer. Elders on the far sides of the sanctuary. Hey, before you guys move, before any of you like gather your stuff and you know start to make your way out he's worthy of worship right he's a king and we can spend we can spend five more minutes i know it's 10 32 pastor 10 32 two <laughs> but he deserves he deserves five more minutes of your time you can do it so let's worship him